What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the first ever episode of Broad Street Banter with Brito. I'm, of course, Jared Brito. I'm very excited about this. This is something that I've wanted to do my entire life. I never shut up talking about sports, so you might as well have a podcast talking about sports, right? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, huge Philadelphia sports fan, if you couldn't tell by that Philadelphia skyline in the background of the logo for this podcast. But yeah, huge Philadelphia sports fan from Philadelphia, currently living in Orlando on the Disney College program. But that Philadelphia fandom follows me, of course. That Philadelphia fandom's never leaving. <laughs> now, on this podcast, we're going to talk a lot about Philadelphia sports, of course, but we're also going to get into all sports. And, you know, it's really becoming the best time of the year for sports. I, I love this time of the year. My three favorite sports baseball, football, and basketball, all going to be on here coming up shortly. Basketball, got about another month or so until it starts, but MLB and the NFL in full swing. So yeah, on this podcast, we're going to talk about anything and everything sports related, but a lot about Philly sports. And we're going to actually kick off with that, talking about the Philadelphia Phillies. Now, this is really funny. I actually uh, plan to record the first episode of this podcast about a week ago from today, but schedule got a little mixed up. So I ended up doing it today. Today is September 22nd when this podcast is being recorded. And if you asked me about the Philadelphia Phillies about a week ago from today, I think I'd have a lot more to say, a lot more negative to say, of course, you know, you know how it is being a, a, a sports fan, but a lot more concerns, especially regarding one player in particular, which I'm sure you can kind of see where I'm going with this, but I'm going to take it through the last two days of the Phillies, which have really boosted my confidence in the team a lot. So first I want to dive into that last game of the series on the 20th against the Braves. It's our last regular season game against the Braves. You know, the next time we see them would be in the postseason. So it's an important one. We had won the first game of the series, dropped the second one. That was just for the series win, of course. Three-game series. Get off to a hot start. I believe in the fourth inning, we're up 4-1. And then things get a little shaky then. Give up a run in the fifth, and then two in the eighth. Jeff Hoffman came in, gave up a run in the eighth, and then Soto gave up a run in the eighth. So now it's all squared up at four. Also, not going to fault Jeff Hoffman too much. He's been really good for us. Gregory Soto, a little more shaky. That Phillies bullpen is still my number one concern heading into the end of the season. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But so, yeah, all tied up, heading into the ninth. Phillies come up. Three up, three down. Rysel Iglesias does a great job for the Braves. Now heading into the bottom of the ninth, the Braves have a chance to walk it off against the Phillies in Atlanta would just get a lot of momentum going their way heading into what might be a potential matchup in the postseason against the Phillies. Kimbrell comes up, walks Murphy. Now this substitution right here is one of the more key moments of the inning because you'll see what happens in the end, as I'm sure a lot of you have already seen. Um, but Luke Williams pinch runs for Murphy and then immediately steals second. Michael Harris strikes out swinging for the first out. Now Luke Williams already stole second, speedy guy, goes and steals third as well. So now he's on third. Only one away. A sacrifice fly wins the game for the Braves. Orlando Arce is at the plate. Didn't originally start this game. I believe Nicky Lopez started in place of him to face Nola. Talk about Nola here in a sec too. Great game for Nola. But Arce comes up. Hits a pop-up and foul ground to right field. <laughs> now, if you're watching the Phillies broadcast, you'd hear John Crook screaming, No, don't catch it, don't catch it, don't catch it. And this is because if he, if Nick Castellanos catches it in right field, in the foul ground... That then gives Luke Williams a chance to tag up from third to home. If he lets it drop, at bat continues. Nick Castellanos, who's already had an incredible game, two home runs, finally going back to that first half Castellanos that we loved, decides, I'm going to catch this and I'm going to gun that runner out at home. So he catches it, does a little spin around, and absolutely guns Luke Williams out at home for the third out, double play. I mean, just an incredible play by Castellanos, a gutsy play, I must say. You know, if that didn't work out, He'd have a lot of answering to do to the coaches and a lot of the media in Philadelphia, but it doesn't matter because it works out. Nick Castellanos continues having himself a game, two home runs, gets that out. We're heading in to extra innings. So the Phillies will get the first crack at it in extra innings because obviously the away team. So top of the 10th, left-hander A.J. Minter is pitching for the Braves. And of course, we have that weird extra inning rule that has been implemented the past couple seasons where there's a runner on second to start extras. I hate this rule. I despise this rule. I think most baseball fans do. I know the MLB has it to speed up games, but I really just despise this rule, if I'm being quite honest with you. But whatever. It's in the game. So we got Garrett Stubbs on second. Schorber draws a walk first at bat. So now we got runners first and second, and Trey Turner is up at the plate. He swings first pitch, grounds into a double play. 
but Schwarber advances to second, so Stubbs gets out at third, and Turner's out at first. Thompson then makes the decision to sub in the speedy Johan Rojas for the not-so-speedy Kyle Schwarber. So now Rojas is on second, we got two outs. Bryce Harper at the plate. Harper falls behind the count early, 1-2, but then draws three straight balls to get a walk. So now we got runners first and second with Alec Bohm coming to the plate. Alec Bohm having a great season for the Phillies. Really love what I've seen from him this year. First pitch, strike looking. Second pitch is a ball, but Harper and Rojas both steal. So now we have runners on second and third. And this completely changes the thought process of the Braves here. Once again, they have A.J. Minter, the left-handed reliever on the mound. And now they have that open base at first with runners on second and third. Two outs. They decide they'd like the matchup better against Bryson Stott, lefty on lefty, with A.J. Minter as opposed to facing Bohm. So they intentionally walk Bohm. Now Bryson Stott is up. Obviously really tough at bat right here against Minter, lefty, lefty. He takes the first pitch looking and then hits a double down the line on the second pitch to score Rojas and Harper. We take the lead 6-4. Such a clutch hit by Stott. Lefty on lefty crime. Love to see that. Hope he can continue this pace going into the postseason. Then at the bottom of the 10th, Matt Schaum comes in, lets up one run on a sacrifice fly, but ends up closing out the game and the Phillies win 6-5 in Atlanta. To win that series against the Braves and win that last regular season game against the Braves before we likely face them in the postseason. Such a big win. Boosted my confidence a lot in the Phillies. And like I mentioned before, that player last week that I was so frustrated in was Nick Castellanos. And here he is hitting two home runs and then throwing out that runner at home, which wins the game for the Phillies because that sends him into extras and then we win the game. Castellanos by far the MVP of that game. And he's finally looking like his old self. Because then the next day on the 21st, we play the Mets and we beat them 5-4. And guess what? Castellanos, two for three, sacrifice fly, home run, go ahead home run in the sixth inning. So I'm really loving what I'm seeing out of the Phillies right now. But jumping back to that Braves game real quick, Aaron Nola. It's been a lot of speculation about who that number two guy in the rotation is going to be after Wheeler heading into the postseason because of how inconsistent Aaron Nola has been throughout the year. But I think after that performance that he had against the Braves, pitched six innings, he gave up six hits, two on runs, eight strikeouts. I think that's good enough to solidify his spot as the number two in the rotation. You know, obviously Aaron Nola struggled this year. 4.57 ERA right now. Probably has one more start in him in these next nine games. But great start against the best lineup in baseball. I think that solidifies him as his number two. But then that jumps into the next question of who's the number three guy. You know, obviously you have Ranger Suarez. Christopher Sanchez, Taiwan Walker, and Michael Lorenzen. Now, starting with that last name, Michael Lorenzen. Man, I don't, I don't know what happened after that no-hitter that he had against the Nationals, but he has been just terrible, really having a rough go at it. His last, I don't even know, five, six starts here. I believe he had also had a relief appearance where he struggled and gave up a couple runs, only got one out. So he's not going to be that guy. He'll probably be a, you know, someone to come in and eat some innings, maybe, but. He's struggling heading into the postseason. You do not want that guy as one of the main features of the rotation. I really like either Ranger Suarez or Christopher Sanchez. Now, Christopher Sanchez is, you know, very young and inexperienced. So that also could lead the question of maybe you go time on Walker, but he's also been a little inconsistent. So it'll be interesting to see what Rob Thompson does. But I think for sure the first two is solidified in Zach Wheeler, Aaron Nola. I'm going to go ahead and assume that Ranger Suarez will be the third. You know, I guess we'll have to see. And we'll see soon because as of the recording of this podcast on September 22nd, there's nine games left in the regular season for the Philadelphia Phillies. We beat the Mets last night in our first game against them, 6-5. Once again, Castellanos coming up clutch. Go ahead, home run in the sixth. We've got three more games against them. Then we go three against the Pirates and then three against the Mets again. So a lot of Phillies-Mets games going on in the next week and a half. Couple of numbers to keep in mind for the next nine games. Five is the magic number to clinch a playoff berth for the Philadelphia Phillies. So they win five games in the playoffs guaranteed. But then I would argue what needs to happen is this next magic number of six. If the Phillies win six games, six of nine, we clinch that top wild card spot and have that home field advantage in that first round of the playoffs in the wild card. That is massive because everyone knows how difficult it is to play in Philadelphia in Citizens Bank Park. So Phillies really need to win six out of the next nine clinch that home field advantage in the wild card, and get things going heading into the postseason. Now, like I mentioned, this podcast is definitely not going to be just Philadelphia sports. And I want to switch gears now and talk about my picks for the MLB awards. 
now that we're nearing the end of the season. Now, I think a lot of these are pretty obvious, if not most of them pretty obvious. There's a couple that are definitely a toss-up, one in particular, but we're going to dive straight into it. And with the AL MVP, no surprise here at all, Shohei Otani is going to be the AL MVP. Now, it's very sad that he got shut down pitching-wise with that UCL injury, and then that also caused the Angels to shut him down for the rest of the season. So we know he's not playing anymore these last, you know, eight or nine games of the season. So here are his stats, final stats this year. A 304 batting average with 44 home runs, 10 B war, which for those of you who don't know is wins above replacement. Probably get into that a little more on another episode if you guys aren't familiar with that. I'm sure a lot of you are. 95 RBIs and 20 stolen bases. So we just talked about his hitting stats. Now let's get into pitching, which is just, I, you know, it really is a blessing to watch someone like Shohei Otani play. You know, the modern day Babe Ruth. He had a 10-5 and record with a 3.14 ERA. Pitched in 23 games, had a complete game shutout. Pitched in 23 games, had through one complete game, 100, 132 innings pitched, 161 strikeouts. Opponents had a 184 average against him, and he had a 1.06 whip. Just we're witnessing history, folks. That's that's all it is. Shohei Otani is one of the most special athletes in history, let alone just baseball players. So major props to him. Such an incredible player. Hope he can come back again pitching soon. Looking like he'll be able to hit again next year. Not sure about pitching. Also worth mentioning with Otani, a free agent after this year. As we know, Angels have struggled mightily for years and years and years now. So it's up in the air what's going to happen with Otani and Trout. Are they going to re-sign Otani? It's not looking like it's heading in that direction. And then if they don't re-sign Otani, is Trout going to be on the move too? So there's a lot going on there, a lot to keep up with. It's going to be an exciting offseason because we have one of the most talented players in baseball history as a free agent. All right, enough with me swooning over Shohei Otani. Let's jump over to the NL MVP. This is the most controversial one. It's a two-man race for sure between Ronald Acuna Jr. and Mookie Betts. I would say about two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago, people were leaning more towards saying Mookie Betts is going to win the MVP of the National League. I think now it's going to be Ronald Acuna. It could still go either way, but in my opinion, Ronald Acuna should walk away with this award. I mean, it'd be so tough not to give a guy who's having this season the award. Let's dive into some of his stats here once again. Still about eight or nine games left in the season. So he's going to be adding on to these. A 335 batting average, 100 RBIs, 39 home runs, and 68 stolen bases. He's the first player ever to have 30 home runs and 60 stolen bases. He's in a club of his own. And he's also only one home run away from joining that illustrious 40-40 club, but it'll actually be the 40-60 club. I think he's going to get that home run. Also, worth mentioning, leads the league in on-base percentage. Love to see that. Just an insane season, and I, I can't stand that he's on the Braves. <laughs> you know, no, shout out Braves fans. You guys have a great team. An insane season. And now Mookie Betts is no slouch either. He's having an amazing season as well. Actually has a higher B-war than Ronald Acuna right now by 0.1, believe it or not. <laughs> but he's batting 309 with 39 home runs, 103 RBIs, 13 stolen bases. Having a great year also. Definitely a better defensive player by far. So that's boosting his B-war a lot as well. So it's going to come down to what do you value more? I think Mookie Betts has kind of calmed down the past two weeks here. I think it's Ronald Acuna's award to lose right now. I think he's my lock for MVP. I see it happening. You can't not get a guy an MVP. If he hits that next home run, he's in 40-40. Come on. First guy to do it in like almost, what is it now? Is it 17 years since Soriano did it? And I think it was 2006 with the Nationals. Got to go to Ronald Acuna. All right, let's jump over to Cy Young. The American League Cy Young, in my opinion, and I think a lot of people's opinions, is Garrett Cole. Now, here's where Phillies fans might hate me. So I have a lot of ties to New York and that North Jersey area, so I do also like the Yankees and am a Yankees fan as well. This is, you know, before my family moved to Philadelphia, past generations, all Yankees fans, so... Of course, I'm going to be there as well. But now baseball is so important to me that I love having two teams. But once again, remember, it's Philadelphia till I die. Don't worry. But now, the Yankees this year, they suck. Let's not let's not sugarcoat it. You know, sorry if that's 
a little inappropriate language. They, they stink. They're terrible. They're, you know, what a bad year for them. Disappointing on all fronts, except for Garrett Cole. 2.75 ERA, pitched 32 games, 200 innings exactly at the moment right now. Had his last start in Yankee Stadium last night, I believe. Um, 1.015 whip, 157 ERA plus, 217 strikeouts. Mark him down as the AL Cy Young Award winner. His first of his career, very well deserved. One of the very few bright spots of a very terrible Yankee season. Now, jumping over to the NL, once again, these NL races are the more, you know, quote unquote, controversial ones to decide. I think just like that Ronald Acuna Mookie Betts race, this one has become a little more clear cut in the last about week, week and a half as well. I like Blake Snell as the NL Cy Young, and I think a lot of people are leaning towards that as well now too. 2.33 2.33 ERA, 227 strikeouts, 176 ERA plus, 1.195 whip. Just a great year for Blake Snell. A disappointing year for the Padres. You know, they're still technically in that wild card run, but I don't see them making that push despite winning about seven games in a row now. I think it's too little, too late. But Blake Snell, a great year. Now there's a couple controversies this year with that NL Cy Young Award. Now we'll get into the other contenders here in a second, but first just looking at Blake Snell, he's barely pitched past that sixth inning. Here's a little bit of a a strange stat. Blake Snell has not thrown more than 113 pitches or pitched more than seven innings in a game this year. He's been six inning. Does it matter when you're that dominant through six innings? Another controversy with Snell is that it's kind of a weird predicament in the sense that he's so incredible and is, you know, dominating batters, but is also pretty wild as well. I'm seeing, according to a Sports Illustrated article, there's only four pitchers ever who have averaged five walks and 10 strikeouts per nine innings in a qualified season. You got Nolan Ryan. He did it a couple times. Nolan Ryan, flamethrower, a little wild throughout his career. Randy Johnson did it twice, Sandy Koufax, and then Snell. Now, if you ask me, Nolan Ryan, Sandy Koufax, and Randy Johnson, that's good company for Blake Snell. Those are the two controversies surrounding him. I think it doesn't matter all that much. You know, I understand people want their pitchers to go deeper into games, sure. But if you're dominating through six innings, you take it. Now, Justin Steele of the Chicago Cubs was really right there neck and neck with Blake Snell for a while. But his past two starts have absolutely tanked his chances of winning the NL Cy Young Award. Against the Diamondbacks on the 15th, pitched six innings, gave up six runs, only five strikeouts, a rough outing. And then his most recent one against the Pittsburgh Pirates. You know, Pirates, not exactly a... Amazing hitting team. He pitched three innings, gave up six runs on eight hits. So that completely tanked his chances. He's out of the race, I would say. You know, I, you know, he's still right there with him. He'll probably get second or third behind or in front of the next guy I'm going to mention, Spencer Strider. Spencer Strider is striking guys out at an elite clip. He's got 270 strikeouts on the year, averaging almost 14 strikeouts per nine inning, but he's given up a lot of runs. He's got a 3.73 ERA. So every single guy has their flaws on this list, but Blake Snell has by far been the most dominant. So I like Blake Snell for that award. Now we'll stay with the NL for Rookie of the Year. Not even close. It's Corbin Carroll. 286 batting average, 25 home runs, 50 stolen bases. First rookie ever with 20 home runs and 50 stolen bases. 73 RBIs, 5.3 B war. Incredible season for Corbin Carroll. He's going to be a special player in the league. Now wrapping things up with the award predictions... We'll jump over to the AL Rookie of the Year Award. Now, wrapping things up with the MLB Award predictions, I'm liking Gunnar Henderson for the AL Rookie of the Year, as are most people. 258 batting average, 27 home runs. On-base percentage a little low at 327, but the slugging at 496, almost hitting 500, 823 OPS, nine triples on the year, 80 RBIs. A great year for Gunnar Henderson. A great year for the 22-year-old Gunnar Henderson. My pick for the AL Rookie of the Year. Now, sort of similar to how I just named my picks for the MLB awards for the whole league, on the next episode of Broad Street Banter, we'll get into Philadelphia superlatives. So, you know, who's been the best player, best pitcher, you know, the biggest comeback player of the year, the biggest surprise. We'll get into all of that next week on Broad Street Banter. But there's a lot of more interesting postseason races going on throughout the MLB. So in the National League, of course, you got that wild card. There's a bunch of teams in contention for that wild card right now. Obviously, Phillies hold the top spot right now, but then but then right behind them, three games behind is the Diamondbacks. Two games behind them, the Miami Marlins, the Cubs, and then two and a half behind the second-seeded Arizona Diamondbacks, the Cincinnati Reds. 
and even the Giants are and the Padres are still in contention there. I think the Giants are three games out of a wild card spot and the Padres four. You know, it's going to be a tough task, but anything is possible. But so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven teams in that wild card race. If you include obviously tougher tasks to make up three or four games heading this late into the season, likely not going to happen. But the Padres are hot right now. Seven game win streak. So you never know. Baseball's unpredictable in the American League. Not as many teams as in contention here. Only four for those three wild card spots. You got the Rays in the top spot, but they're only a game and a half behind from taking the division from the Orioles. So we'll have to watch that race there. Then you got the Blue Jays with the second spot. And then the Rangers and Mariners both tied for that third spot. Now, the really interesting thing there is that Rangers and Mariners tie. If you look at that AL West race right now, the Astros only lead by a half game over the Rangers and the Mariners. So that is going to come down to the wire. You know, anything could happen there may even come down to last game of the season. So that's going to be really interesting to see, especially because next week, the Astros and Mariners will face off in a three-game series. Major postseason implications there. Going to be highly entertaining to watch. Who knows what can happen? It's the best thing about baseball. So unpredictable. So a lot of fun races around the league there. We'll have more answers in about a week as to what this playoff picture is going to look like. Really, really excited for that. But now we're going to switch gears a little bit and get into some football. So going to talk a little Eagles. Obviously, like I mentioned, Broad Street Banter, name of the podcast, kind of shows. Have a little bit of Philadelphia bias here. We're going to talk a lot about Philadelphia. So the Eagles are 2-0 in the season. Got that week one win against the Patriots, week two win against the Vikings. But you'd almost think that they're 0-2 with how everyone feels. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and act like, you know, I don't, I don't feel this way too not the two best wins you've seen out of the Eagles, but, you know, wins are wins. It's tough to win in the National Football League. The really ugly win against the Patriots in Week 1, 25-20. And then that Week 2 game against the Vikings was an interesting one. I think the main concern of that game was the passing game. And I think that's been my main concern with the Philadelphia Eagles so far, those first two games of the season, is the passing and the offensive play calling. Um, I'm not, you know, it's still very early on in the season, but... Brian Johnson's going to have to show us a little bit more here. Credit where credit's due. It's a good adjustment to figure out that the Vikings are just giving us to run the whole game and run the ball the entire game. But it's not exactly impressive play calling to call 30 inside zones to to beat a team. It's not going to happen a lot in the National Football League. Obviously, it worked with the Vikings, and I'm happy it did. And I I give credit where credit's due. But you're not going to... DeAndre Swift's not going to get 28 carries, 175, you know, every game. It's, it's just not going to happen. And I'm very happy he did. What an incredible game for DeAndre Swift. Best game from an Eagles running back probably since <laughs> LaShawn McCoy, to be honest with you. You know, an incredible game. Major props to him. Devontae Smith also had an incredible game. Four receptions for 131 and a touchdown. But still just want to see more out of that offense. Obviously really banged up defensively too. We did at one point hold a 20-point lead over the Vikings, but... They ended up coming back. Kirk Cousins actually played really well this game. 31 of 44, 364 and four touchdowns. Had a really good game. The most costly play for the Vikings that game was that Justin Jefferson fumble into the end zone at half. Who knows what would have happened if he scored on that play. So a big break there for the Eagles. Pull out the win, 34-28. Feels like it's been a year since they played. You know, it's only been eight days, but they played that last Thursday. And their next game is on Monday against the Buccaneers. Buccaneers 2-0 on the season. Baker Mayfield's looked pretty impressive. I'm impressed with what I've seen from him so far. We have lost, I believe, five straight games, including a playoff game to the Buccaneers. So, got to lock in. Tampa's a tough place to play. Loud stadium. Eagles are five-point favorites right now. That game is at 7:15 on ABC. We'll see what happens there. I like our chances there. Just want to see some more offensive explosion in that game. And more of what we saw last year from the Eagles and a little more consistency in the passing game and mixing in the pass and run both effectively. The main concern heading into that game is by far defensive injuries. We know Avante Maddox is going to be out. Hope he recovers from his injury soon. But then questionable heading into that game is Zach Cunningham, James Bradbury, Terrell Edmonds, Josh Sweat, and Fletcher Cox. This is as of the injury report from yesterday, September 21st. And we also know N'Kobe Dean will not be playing in that game as well. So a lot of injuries defensively. I think James Bradbury might be the most important one there because Buccaneers have two good receivers in Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. So hopefully all these players that are questionable will be able to get on the field on Monday. But looking more around the NFL and what has happened so far throughout the league, the main story of the past week has been 
sadly, the worst part of football, of sports in general, injuries. Wish they didn't happen. Unfortunately, they're a part of sports. But on Monday, Nick Chubb's gruesome injury that's going to sideline him for the rest of the year and likely maybe in, even into next season in 2024. Really hope he recovers there. Big loss for the Browns. And then yesterday, we find out Trayvon Diggs tears his ACL in practice. Now, look, of course, as an Eagles fan, I'm the biggest Cowboys hater out there. <laughs> no, I'm playing. Uh, not a great relationship with the Cowboys, but she, I mean, you hate to see that. Trayvon Diggs, such an incredible start to the season, along with that Cowboys defense. You know, especially that week one matchup against the Giants. Seems like Trayvon Diggs was everywhere, not allowing receptions to anyone, forcing fumbles, and then unfortunately gets injured in practice. You hate to see that. But wishing speedy recoveries to the both of them. Now, just like the Cowboys and the Browns, the Jets suffered a massive loss in week one, despite the victory in week one against the Bills, which was a very impressive one with that kickoff return touchdown in overtime. But Aaron Rodgers, who they traded for in the offseason, who was giving all New York Jets fans hope that they could make a run into the playoffs, tears his Achilles tendon four plays into the game, and he's out likely for the rest of the year. It's been talk of him possibly coming back in the postseason, but the Jets would have to make it to the postseason for that to happen. I think truly one of the most devastating injuries, obviously all injuries are devastating, but one of the most devastating injuries to a fan base in a franchise in recent memory because the Jets were looking up. Jets have had a lot of struggles for a while now. When they traded for Aaron Rodgers, people thought, you know, there's a chance they might win the Super Bowl. I wouldn't, I wasn't going as far as to say that Aaron Rodgers had a bit of a rough year last year. We had to see what he could do first, but now we won't even be able to see that at all because he's out for the season, which you hate to see. And completely changed the perspective of the Jets on the season because, I mean, let's let's not sugarcoat it. I'm sure he's a he's a good guy, but Zach Wilson is just not a good quarterback in the NFL. You know, they win that game in week one, but it's not because of Zach Wilson. Even that touchdown to Garrett Wilson in the back corner of the end zone was a pretty horrific throw that Garrett Wilson just made an insane play in catching. And then he comes out week two as well and throws three picks against the Cowboys. And obviously, Cowboys defense really good, but three picks is unacceptable against any defense. So now don't like the Jets' odds of doing anything on the season, which is really unfortunate. I hope Zach Wilson can turn around and get something going. You know, he has a, a good amount of talent around him. Maybe he could get something going. But yeah, really feeling for Jets fans there. Hopefully Aaron Rodgers can come back next year and make a run with you guys. Now, speaking of really tough starts to the season, I want to talk about the Chicago Bears. Now, I didn't personally have insanely high hopes for the Bears, but a lot of NFL fans, a lot of people in media thought that maybe Justin Fields would take that leap and the Bears would be a solid team this year. And two weeks in, and he's just looking looking really bad this season so far. You know, two touchdowns, three picks on the year, only about 400 yards passing, two losses on the season. Just, just really struggling here early on. Lost to the Green Bay Packers and the Buccaneers. You know, two solid teams, two tough defenses to face. So maybe he could still turn it around. But then he goes in the press conference yesterday and is getting asked about his struggles and his sort of robotic play these first two games. And he throws out a comment that maybe it's the coaching that's causing me to be like this. And that's just not what you want to hear out of your supposed star quarterback. He did retract those statements later on in the day, but saying that, you know, he was misquoted. But it's tough to misquote that, especially when you said it directly. And then also one of the more odd things to happen so far in the season is Bears defensive coordinator Alan Williams resigning as the defensive coordinator of the Bears. Now, there's been some rumors, nothing confirmed yet, speculation that there was something going on with the former defensive coordinator being raided by the FBI. The Bears have strongly denied those rumors. So we still don't know what happened there. It's, I mean, extremely unprecedented for a coordinator to resign two weeks into the season, no matter how bad of a start it's been for the team. But switching over to week three, we got some interesting games coming up here on Sunday and Monday in the National Football League. I would say definitely a, a weaker slate of games as opposed to the first two weeks of games. Nothing really catching my eye here. The primetime game on Sunday is Pittsburgh versus Raiders. Not exactly one to call home about. I think one matchup that should be interesting is the Chargers versus the Vikings. The, the Chargers need to get a win. 0-2 to start the season. Right now they face the Vikings next week. They got the Raiders and the weeks after that, Cowboys Chiefs. Schedule's not getting any easier these next four weeks or so. So they got to try to squeeze out a win against the Vikings. And, you know, despite the loss to the Eagles, the Vikings, like I said, were impressive against the Eagles and they'll be back at home against the Chargers. And then, of course, that Monday night game, like I mentioned, Eagles at Tampa Bay, probably 
the game of the week. But once again, Eagles bias might be coming out there. I think one of the more competitive games. Um, and there's actually two Monday night games again this week. You'll have Rams at Bengals and the later slate at 8.15 on ESPN. So a lot to look forward to here with the postseason coming up in the MLB just about two weeks away. The NFL season in full swing. And obviously basketball season right around the corner. Don't not looking forward to that too much because the 76ers, whew, an absolute mess. But still love basketball, so I am looking forward to it. Obviously, just joking. But a lot going on with the Sixers. So pretty soon, going to have those three sports in full swing. And I look forward to catching up with all of you again to update on how that postseason picture is playing now for the MLB. And hopefully the Phillies clinch that one seed. The Eagles win this week. And we'll have a lot to talk about next week on Broad Street Banter with Brito. Thanks for tuning in.